For September. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, Saint Maximilian Colby. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son. Of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Amen. Great. So uh, this is uh, you know a little bit unusual for me. I wasn't here last month for uh, Father Shabbat's amazing talk. Everyone's told me how uh, how terrific and entertaining it was, which is a pretty amazing achievement given that it was a talk about exorcism that he managed to make it so entertaining. Um, John Canavan tells me he's now known as the Happy Exorcist. <laughs> So, uh, as you know, God and Beer, it's an initiative of the Knights of the Southern Cross, and I just wanted to let you know about a great event that the Knights of the Southern Cross did just a few days ago. Um, on the 1st of September, they held their annual Priest Support and Education Fund Dinner. And there, was 400, there were 450 people in attendance that night, and they raised $77,000 for the seminary, for the education of our, of our future priests in the seminary. Can we give a round of applause for the Knights of the Southern Cross? Yeah, and uh, there's a great write-up about the event on the Melbourne Catholic website, which uh, you can see just a part of there, but if you just go to the Melbourne Archdiocese website and look for their, um, their news section, you'll find a great article there about, about that uh, night. Hands up who was there at the PSCF dinner. Yeah, fantastic. So tonight's talk is, um, I would say, you know, a little bit of an unusual one. It's, a, it's more of a story or it's, it's about a person rather than a topic or a... Uh, you know, some sort of some sort of issue that might be in the news or something like that. Um, this is this is uh, this grew out of a conversation I had with uh, Olivia Shamoon at the start of the year when we had the first God and Beer at the what was it called Matthew Flinders Hotel, where we had Matthew um, Kennedy speaking that night about his AFL football career. I got talking to Olivia there, who um, it turns out has a family connection to Matthew Kennedy. Um, if, I, if I can get this, this diagram right, Matthew is the future son-in-law of John Canavan, and John Canavan is Olivia's father-in-law. So I should have got a chart with a diagram on it, hopefully you can figure that out. So um, just talking to Olivia there, she was telling me about her, her music career. She's a, an aspiring uh, musician. She's you know, studied music, and she, she is in the middle of um, you know, pursuing that career in music. And in particular, it's, it's in the field of jazz music, which is you know, a fairly um, unusual career choice. With, you know, within music, there's lots of different areas, and you know, jazz music is, is one of those. Um, I found it really interesting hearing about her passion for music and her faith, and how she's trying to combine them together. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. And I just thought it was really inspiring to hear a young Catholic person who's, who's so dedicated to their faith and wants to Bring that, bring that to life in their art, in their work, and share it with other people through that art form. I thought that's a really beautiful and inspiring thing, and I thought it would make a really interesting um, talk for God here. So that's, that was sort of the, the genesis or origin of, of tonight's talk. Um, Olivia is going to start by performing uh, one or two songs for us, and then her uh, father-in-law, John Canavan, is going to interview her. Uh, and then we might finish off with, with one or two more songs at the end of the night. So um, here is Olivia Shamoon Canavan. Well, good evening, everyone. Hey. <laughs> and uh, thank you, John, for that lovely introduction and for having me here tonight. Um, this is, uh, you know, I often play to audiences. Um, sing and, and talk, probably talk a little bit less than I will be tonight at my jazz gigs. Um, but this is certainly something new for me and I'm really looking forward to um, sharing this evening with, with people of faith tonight and really being able to um, just talk about my journey 
Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'm certainly very um, humbled by the turnout tonight. Um, I really appreciate your interest in my story and um, I hope we can have a bit of fun too. I'm sure my father-in-law will uh, ensure it's an interesting night. <laughs> and um, we're going to start off with a couple of jazz tunes, I thought. Um, try to pick a couple of jazz standards that I hope you may know. The first one, maybe some of you will know. The second one, you certainly will know. And if you don't know it, I'd be worried for you. <laughs> so this is um, a beautiful jazz standard by Ray Henderson and Mort Dixon from the 30s, I believe. And uh, it's called Bye Bye Blackbird. Hope you enjoy it. before because I normally have a band behind me. I never play keys on my jazz gigs so if there's any um, jazz critics in the room you're probably not impressed by my jazz playing on the keyboard. I don't claim to be a jazz pianist so forgive me. <laughs> now this one I'm sure you'll know it. Um, please feel free to sing with me. Once in a lullaby 
see me back in the economy section of the room up there? <laughs> All right, jazz. Never knew a lot about jazz. Never listened to jazz music much. I'd uh, sort of rock and roll, 60s era, like Kevin May. Go along to rock and roll bands, opera once. Saw Pavarotti sing it once. Yeah, they don't like it when you sing along in opera, do they? <laughs> At least jazz you can sing along better. Well. I first heard Olivia a few years ago when Joseph told me he was going out with a, a lovely Lebanese girl who was Maronite and I said, oh, what's Maronite? He told me, I, said, oh, I thought they were related to the Vegemites, but <laughs> great religion and faith. And um, I saw her and I remember ringing up a friend of mine who's entertainment, Gary Pinto. And Gary said, I said, Joseph got engaged with a girl called Olivia. And he goes, that's not Olivia Shamoon, is it? I said, yes. And he said, John, that girl had, would be in the top three jazz singers in the whole of Australia. Now Gary Pinto is um, one of the judges for the uh, Australia's Got Talent and has always tried to get Olivia to come on stage and to come and perform on TV but she felt that it would jeopardise her faith. So uh, over the time that I've known you Olivia um, and I've come to see you and, and know you, your, your faith is very important to you and um, you come from a great family. Her mother's down the back, stand up Lena, stand, there she is, give her a big hand there. <laughs> Now she can't sing, but gee, she can talk, can't she? She can talk. She'd be a good auctioneer, I can tell you that. And her, her dad, John, he couldn't make it tonight. So um, you come from a great family, you come from Mill Park, and most people don't know where Mill Park is. It's not the end of the earth, but you can see it from here, it's a long way away. And uh, you're involved with the church over that side of town. But can you tell us a little bit, uh, I think your former parish priest at Mill Park, Father Brendan Lane, who's just celebrated 50 years as a priest, has just turned up. So congratulations, Father Brendan. Hi, Father Brendan. Right there. there he is. Well, I can remember Father Lane was a great friend of mine. He came to our house one day, and, uh, and Olivia was sitting over there in the corner. And Olivia went up to her and said, Hi, Father, can you remember me? She was only 12 or 13. And he comes with me after her, and he said, That's Olivia Shimon. He said, That family's royalty. So he comes from a really good family. and. Uh, and bringing up the children and bringing up the faith can certainly make a difference. 
So can you tell everybody here today a little bit about yourself, how you got involved in jazz music, a little bit about your culture. Your father obviously um, left Lebanon because um, of the situation that was going over there, particularly I think at some stage he felt his, his life would be in danger and would be a much better opportunity to come out here. So it was a difficult decision to, to come out with, with and to, to uh, come overseas to Australia. And so tell us a little about your story and the background of the family. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I, I certainly come from a very strong faith background. I'm what they call the cradle Catholic. I was born into a, a very strong practicing um, Catholic family and I'm very grateful to my parents, John and Lena, for the way that they cultivated faith in the home. Uh, we prayed often together as a family and um, yeah, we certainly, you know, mass was a non-negotiable. As a child, often you know you don't you don't really understand that, but you just go along with it. Otherwise, you know there's there's a problem. So, <laughs> but I'm so grateful for that foundation now, of course, and understand it. <laughs> um, yeah, so I I always had the faith, but I think I really sort of took it on for myself through my teenage years. You kind of go through that journey of maturing as you know, a human being developing and once you have the ability to, to rationalise and reason and you have questions, that's really when you start to, um, you know, ask those big questions about the faith and for me that happened in my teenage years. Um, very blessed that I was able to attend a youth group uh, at Mill Park, Life Teen, which is still running today and that crew in the middle table are pretty much all the leaders from Life Teen. <laughs> um, it was such a great foundation for me and allowed me to socialise with other teenagers who were like-minded and also to ask the big questions. There's a really strong catechesis presence in the Life Team program um, and that was super important for me as a um, teenager with somewhat of a big head maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, so I had that and I guess that sort of brings me into my mid-twenties now. You know, when, when um, study comes into the picture and especially university in my case. I've, I did my undergrad, my Bachelor of Music in Jazz Voice at Monash and I'm doing my Masters of Music Therapy at Melbourne Uni now as well and both of these institutions are by no means Catholic in any way, shape or form, quite the opposite. <laughs> um, and uni culture, you know, it kind of slaps you in the face as a young Catholic. So that kind of was again another journey for me in my faith. Um, you have to, you know, you have to be sure of yourself and um, you have to be prepared to face things that are quite challenging. Um, and so that's, yeah, kind of also part of my current journey now at Melbourne Uni. Maybe we'll talk more about that later. Um, but on the jazz front, I came to appreciate jazz in my teenage years. Um, I kind of was faced with the big question of, what am I going to do at uni? And I knew I wanted to do music, um, but you see, I grew up playing piano as well, classical piano and flute, um, but with singing, you know, we say with the classical training, we call it, you know, the formal classical A and B exams and all that stuff. But with singing, I say I had church training. I didn't train formally as a singer at all through my childhood, but I was always singing in mass from a very young age and have always done that with my sisters. Um, and so that was my formation, really, as a vocalist. Um, it certainly um, now has a whole new, taken a whole new meaning, the fact that I started out like that. I think it's very important um, and it definitely, yeah, formed the way I view singing in a, in a very certain way. Um, and so I took on the jazz thing when I was about 17, took a couple of lessons in year 12 and then auditioned for the courses and somehow got in. <laughs> um, and then I undertook my jazz training at Monash. So that was really the start. That was, that was five years ago now. Now, I'm somewhere between 60 and death, and obviously you're a lot younger. We used to watch the old musicals, and someone said to me once after seeing you've got, you've got a very distinctive voice, but in some ways very similar to Doris Day, and someone else <coughs> put a cross between Doris Day and in some ways Olivia Newton-John with your, your beautiful singing that you do. What sparked the interest in jazz? I mean, obviously, your father coming from Lebanon, there wouldn't be too many jazz musicians around Lebanon, I wouldn't think. No. <laughs> so, so what sparked your interest in jazz? Yeah, um, we, when I was in high school, we attended this festival in Mount Gambia, which was called Generations in Jazz. And if any of you know the trumpeter James Morrison, he's kind of a famous bald trumpet guy who gets on TV sometimes. 
He's the only really famous jazz musician in the country. <laughs> um, but he, he ran this festival um, for many years. He's only since stepped down. And it's basically, I like to call it like a mini World Youth Day for jazz kids. So there was like 6,000 of us. We'd all drive out to Mount Gambier in South Australia and we'd be in this huge tent. Um, and we had these evening performances where international artists were brought over by James Morrison because he's famous. And so he put on these massive shows for us and um, that was the first time, I remember distinctively, the first time I watched a jazz vocalist. She was an Australian, actually, Olivia Kindamo. And she started to improvise, as you heard me do a little bit of before. We call it like scat singing or vocal improvisation. And um, that was the first time I'd ever seen it live. And me back then being very much a classical-minded musician, I was like, what is she doing? That is so cool. <laughs> you know, there's no words and she's just flying through these notes. and. I was just mesmerised, truly. Um, and then my then teacher, music teacher, he said to me, there you go, Olivia, that's something to aspire to. And I, I just thought, there's no way I'd ever be able to do that. Like, what? I don't know what just happened, but I loved it. <laughs> so that was really the start, that festival. And then, um, yeah, I, I then actually had those lessons with her. I was very lucky to meet her and connect with her. Um, and it's interesting you mentioned the shows and the musicals and Doris Day and that, because in the jazz tradition, we have what we call the Great American Songbook, and basically it's a culmination of all of the American musicals and movies from the 20s and 30s and 40s. Um, and those are the, mo the songs from those movies and musicals became jazz standards. So the jazz community kind of like adopted them into the jazz repertoire and they've been, you know, done thousands of times. Um, and those are the songs that live on and, you know, we still play them all around the world. Um, so I certainly love that tradition. That's really my thing. Jazz is so broad, but I love the Great American Songbook and yeah. hence Somewhere Over the Rainbow and tunes like that. Yeah. Some beautiful songs from that era. Obviously working, and I did as well in entertainment for many years, but working in the entertainment industry is very much secular. Uh, and I used to find towards the end of my entertainment as a, as a comedian, um, you feel though, what can you do to try and touch the hearts of people and working in the second industry as well, how do you find, how do you feel that your influence as a jazz musician can bring Christ to, to the heart of the people you're, you're speaking to who are sometimes not at all orientated towards knowing more about their faith or about our Lord? Yeah, it certainly is um, a very secular music scene and especially in Australia actually. In America, so I hear I haven't actually been there, the jazz scene is still kind of connected to its gospel roots. Um, you know, they there are bands that will do a prayer circle before they go on stage and all of that. But that's just so unheard of in Australia, in the jazz scene. It's, it's super secular. Um, but where it really started for me, when I was doing my undergrad, we took jazz history as a unit. And um, this was being presented by one of our lecturers who's very sort of lefty, as we say, um, but he presented, you know, jazz history and that includes the gospel roots of jazz. So, um, you know, he started to share with us how the blues came out of gospel and jazz came out of gospel and so many of the jazz greats that we look up to today, Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald, Oscar Peterson on the piano, all these figures, they all grew up playing in church, in black church in America. So um, that was presented to us very plainly and clearly. And I was kind of sitting there going, yeah, like this is the history of jazz. So why is no one talking about this in Australia? Um, of course, Australia is a very secular country and that filters in and people that I work with, often they don't have a sense of faith. There are some that do, but most don't. Um, most certainly don't want to talk about it on gigs or anything like that. So that, that unit that I took, it kind of gave me license to start thinking about, well, what am I doing? You know, I actually am. A Christian, I am a Catholic, so how am I going to, you know, draw these two things together? And um, I'll give you one example, which was a really defining moment for me. It was in my second year recital. I really felt like the Lord was calling me to introduce my faith into my music in like quite a concrete way. Um, so I took this hymn. It's called "Jesus's Blood Never Failed Me Yet." It's by an unknown composer. It's very old. Um, and the lyrics are, Jesus' blood never failed me yet, and it repeats itself, and then it says, and there's one thing I know, that he loves me so, and that's it, two lines. Um, and I thought, with my jazz brain, why don't I just take that and recontextualise it into 
a kind of free and expansive jazz improvisation with my band in my recital. Because one of the things we had to do was show free, free improvisation as one of the genres within jazz. So um, there I was, I wrote the chart, Jesus' blood never failed me yet. I took it into rehearsal and I'm thinking, what on earth are the band gonna think of this? <laughs> my bassist was Jewish, he loved it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, they were, they were so fine, the band, they were all on board. I was really excited to do it in the recital, a bit nervous. Um, and I remember filling in the recital form. We had to write our repertoire in a list and it was like, autumn leaves, fly me to the moon, <laughs> Jesus' blood never failed me yet. <laughs> it was just so starkly like different to everything else. Um, yeah, and I, re I actually remember how fast and hard my heart was beating when we did that. And I was just praying in that moment, like, God, give me peace, you know, I'm doing this for you and I, I, I'm trying to, you know, do your will and answer your call to just kind of proclaim my faith right now. And it actually went really well and I got a good mark. And I had a lefty marker as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was really the beginning. And then came, you know, bringing gospel into my gigs. Um, sometimes I, I play gospel hymns on my gigs and um, my piano player, Russell, is an absolute monster, especially in, in the gospel realm of things. And he is also a Christian. So that's been beautiful to connect with him over that music. Um, and then my album, which we'll probably talk about, there's Christian themes in that as well. So yeah, just trying to bring it into the music. Like that's really, that's really the main thing for me. Like I, anyone who, who's close to me knows that I'm not, I don't do well in, you know, big confrontational discussions and I'm not someone who's able to pull out all the apologetics terminology and, you know, debate the existence of God with an atheist. That's really not me. Um, but I think, yeah, I think God's given me music as an avenue to, to share his love and, and the joy of our faith um, with the world. And so a lot of my sharing of my faith happens in the music, really. Yeah. So improvisation is a gift from the Holy Spirit. So do you think you could do anything for Father Brendan Lane to the Carlton Football Chair? <laughs> <laughs> we believe. <laughs> Are they going to win on Saturday, Father Brendan? Easy. Easy. <laughs> I think you better go to confession now. Better go to confession. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, have you had the opportunity to share your Catholic faith amongst any of the people, like when you're doing the gigs? Mm. You occasionally some people will come up to me after I'd finished the show and they say, you know, I did comedy but you didn't swear. Oh. So, does anybody ever come up to you like that and say, well, I've never heard a musician before who's brought our Lord into into mm. his, uh, his repertoire, her repertoire. Yeah, I, I certainly, um, I'm always really moved by comments from fellow Catholics or people of faith that, that um, approach me at my gigs and who share with me that they can, you know, they can hear the sentiments of my Catholic faith in my music and, or maybe the way that I introduce a song, um, you know, this, the song on my album still, the title track still, um, really came out of prayer and it is it is literally about the importance of prayer and finding time to be in silence with God um, It's not explicit like that in the lyric, but that is the meaning of the song And so I've certainly had yeah some of my fellow Catholic friends and family share with me that um, they appreciate You know what I'm doing in my music and that's really um, really beautiful for me to hear and encouraging um, as for overt conversations with my peers in jazz. I have had conversations with, especially my close band, who are kind of like my, I guess my closest friends in the, in the industry. Um, yeah, on at least one occasion with each of them, we've talked about faith. And it's really interesting to hear that all of them actually do have a connection to church. It just happens that this is the case in my band. Perhaps that was God's, God's will that I would connect with people who are very much open to what I believe in. Um, although, you know, for, for instance, one of my band members, I won't name names because some people know them. <laughs> one of my band members said to me that he grew up in Planet Shakers, the church Planet Shakers. So I don't really know anything about Planet Shakers other than I'm pretty sure there's drums in church, which is not really my thing, but that's another story. <laughs> Um, and he, he told me that he, he's now agnostic and he, um, he fell away from the church and part of it was that he didn't feel that there was a lot of substance there. Um, that kind of led to a conversation about the Catholic church and the history of the church and 
Um, yeah, and then, you know, I shared about the sacraments and things like that. And we've kind of never spoken about it again, but, you know, that happened. And um, as I said, my keys player, he's, he currently plays in a church, in a Pentecostal sort of church, I think. Um, so sometimes these conversations happen, and I, I, certainly, I certainly appreciate knowing that the people closest to me are happy to have those discussions, and they're not arguments. You know, they're kind of like sharings. Um, and, of course, I wouldn't work with people if they wanted to argue with me about my faith, that'd just be like, well, you're out of the van, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have, to, you have to in music, especially in jazz, when you're improvising together, you have to have a, a good connection. You have to have a friendship. There has to be mutual respect or the music just doesn't happen. It doesn't work well. Well, it's the old story, shine your light. I remember I was overseas in, in 1997 and I went to Calcutta and I remember a story told to me about Mother Teresa and one of the reporters asked her, you know, there's so many millions of people in Calcutta, but so few Catholics. Mm -hmm. And she said, my business is to love God's business is conversion. Mm -hmm. And I think with the songs you're singing, uh, the way you present yourself, the beauty of the songs, the, and the, the way that you can touch hearts through music, uh, often Father Lane would agree with this, so many people, when they go to church these days, they go to, at Christmas and Easter. And that's often the times at, at funerals or at weddings that you can really touch the hearts of people, and sometimes it's through music. A song that he's played when your loved one's been, you know, the mass has been offered for it. it. It really touches people, and that's right. We can just be the seeds that God sows, and, and the rest is up to our Lord. So, where, where do you think your journey is going to take you from now? I mean, obviously, you've worked very hard over the last several years to get yourself to this stage where you are, and you're extremely well known in, in the industry as one of the finest jazz musicians in Australia. And that's, that's I never knew anything about jazz, but from speaking to so many people, You've got a great name out there, and you're certainly not embarrassed by your faith, and you're proud to stand up for it. But where do you think our Lord's calling you from here? Where would you like to go with it? Thanks, John. I've never, I've never heard anyone say I'm one of the finest jazz musicians in the country. That's lovely. I've got to go I mean, to the I've got to go to the <laughs> Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it's one of those things that I, I kind of, when I was younger, I got a little bit caught up in the whole... Um, what am I going to do with this? Like, am I going to go for it? And we say hustle in the in the music industry. That's a really big word. I'm going to hustle and get all the gigs and play all the festivals and get all the scholarships and blah, 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 all that jazz. Pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> See, I can tell jokes. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think, um, you know, I was a bit immature then and, you know, I was getting really caught up in the egoism of the industry, which is one of its biggest detriments. It's really quite dangerous um, when you start to talk about ego and music and um, yeah making it all about me 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 there's certainly that risk in being a musician um, but these days I, I feel like I'm trying to have just more of a um, sort of mindset that I just need to go where the Lord calls me and also that um, my career and especially this jazz thing it's one part of my life um, which I absolutely love and hope I'll continue to do. I hope I'll continue to play gigs and maybe do another recording and all of that. Um, but there's, there's so much more to my life and ultimately, like, the call for all of us as Catholics is to holiness and that's the ultimate aim. So wherever God calls me um, in the sense of, you know, in my vocation with Joseph and um, in there's also music therapy that I'm doing too, um, I just want to be really open to God and his plan I love um, the verse in Jeremiah where the Lord says, um, I know the plans I have for you, plans not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. Those words really mean a lot to me. And I think if we're to kind of like get too caught up in a certain career pathway, in any career really, but especially in music, um, it can be, it can kind of be, uh, induce fear and anxiety and we're not meant to be people of fear, we're meant to be people of hope and trusting in God and his plan is is my plan, <laughs> really. Was well, the old story, how do you make God laugh? You tell him your plans. <laughs> Sometimes his plans like and our plans don't match the same. Yeah. Tell us a little about your family life. You come from a wonderful family. Your father, John, he's, uh, he's uh, 60 this year and your mother's, yeah. of course, a lot younger than that, but you've got, you've got to come from a family of four. Yeah, four girls. Tell us a little bit yeah. about the sisters. Yeah, so my eldest sister, Teresa, she's in Wagga Wagga at the moment with her husband. She's a teacher and she's studying psychology at the moment. Marie's here. Marie, I run a choir with Marie at um, 
uh, St Francis and she's an amazing dietitian and also a member of the youth uh, leader team, the core team at Life Team. And then I have lovely Grace, my younger sister. Grace is a, a beautiful soul who um, brings so much joy into our lives and she's, a, she's an absolutely um, obsessed dancer. She dances many nights a week <laughs> at, a, at a great school. And yeah, my, my parents, John and Lena as well, um, yeah, we're a, we're a close family and um, music is sort of always part of our lives. We had a little family <coughs> band back in the day and um, yeah, I, I'm grateful to my parents that they paid for all those music lessons and <laughs> encouraged me to do it. Um, I think it wasn't like a shock to them, also because my, my father's brother, Danny Shamoon, is a concert pianist, so music was kind of in the family and um, they certainly supported me. I, I came to realise with some of my peers in uni, some people didn't have families that were really happy about them pursuing music, um, but my parents did. So yeah, love my family, they're beautiful. And um, I think, you know, the most special thing is that we all share the faith, even into our adulthood. My sisters, all of us, we're all very strong in our faith and I'm really, really grateful to God that we've all, you know, stuck with it and we can share this journey together. It's so enriching to, to share it with your family. Well, family is really the essence of everything. I remember listening to a talk one day and the, the priest said to me, family, F-A-M-I-L-Y, father and mother, I love you. It's so important that you've got a great father. I know John, I've spoken many times with John, he's passionate about his faith. He was mm. uh, persecuted strongly in Lebanon for his faith and felt strongly that he, he wanted to come out to Australia to give uh, an opportunity. You met beautiful Lena. Lena, are you from, where are you from again, Lena? Lebanon. I mean, she was born here. You are born here. <laughs> also a Lebanese background. <laughs> where, yeah. what come? Robin Bar. Is that Lebanese for Robin Bar? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a great family, so your father and mother made a big sacrifice and uh, I know he's very, very proud of you whenever you perform. And yeah. can I just add one thing as well? My dad is um, very overt about his faith at work, like very overt, like Divine Mercy image on the truck window. In fact, his business is literally called JC Lord Towing and there's the fish on the, the logo, yeah. Um, so he's like that. And then it just so happened that my, my lovely husband, Joseph, is also like that. His, um, his business, Canavan Constructions, has you know Christian imagery in the logo, and he inspires me so much with the conversations he also has on work sites with some very challenging, strong-headed men. <laughs> but he, um, he stands up for the Lord and for our faith so much. So yeah, I'm, I'm so inspired by all the family around me, and my in-laws, John and Karen as well. Of course, everyone knows what they've done um, in the church for Divine Mercy, and. Um, in that apostolate, and my beautiful siblings in law <laughs> as well, <laughs> there at the back. Yeah, so, so. How have you found that, that your faith has, has, has brought you to this tonight? I mean, the influence of priests in your life, like Father Brendan when you were there at the uh, Mill yeah. Park, and the mm -hmm. other priests, Father Anthony, who's over there at the moment, they, they've given you a big chance, they've given you, you're in charge of their music area there on a Sunday night with the Mass. How, how do you find that your faith has helped you in that area? with given the, the backing of the priest, to basically leave it to you. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, it's, really, uh, it's really heartwarming when you have you know, a parish priest who, who really shepherds his flock. And we've been so blessed at St Francis. When we first moved over to Mill Park, it was the lovely Father Brendan, who's here tonight. Um, and then uh, Father Anthony Girolami, who's, who's still there now. Um, and also some assistant priests as well. And, you know, the presence of a good priest in your, in your parish um, is, is really just an, an incredibly powerful thing. And um, we, we, of course, should pray for all of our priests. They, they carry such a, a heavy burden in their vocation as well. It's not easy. Like, you know, I, doing music therapy now, I have even just a little bit of insight into what, it's, what it means to go into a hospital, for example, and be with a sick person. Well, that's just one of the hundred things that a priest will do, for example. Um, so, you know, they do so much for us. And I think for me, um, with music ministry, it certainly um, meant a lot to us that our parish priests always, you know, gave us the opportunity to share our gifts in the Mass. And um, <laughs> the youth choir at St Francis has been through so many phases <laughs> of music styles. And we finally kind of landed at traditional music in the Mass <laughs> after so many years. Um, and Father Anthony has been right behind us, even when some of the parishioners weren't happy, we started to sing the Mass parts in Latin, but we do it anyway. <laughs> yeah, but, um, <laughs> yeah, so 
the support of the parish priest really means everything when you're, you know, you're trying to run youth ministry, trying to do music ministry, whatever it is that you're doing, charity. Um, yeah, we, we are absolutely so grateful for them and we should pray for our priests and I think right now we should give them a hand because there's a few in the room. Now, we've often been told some music can put us to sleep. But music therapy, tell me about music therapy. I was astounded when you were working at, was it Corpus Christi, Age for the Dying? Oh, O'Neill House. O'Neill House in Prague. Where a lot of the, Villa Maria Catholic Home, where a lot of people are dying. And I was very interested to understand that when she would go in there, tell them what you do and how music actually, particularly those who've been involved in serious car accidents or things like that, they play songs for them and they can recognise those songs. And she teaches them to learn them again and they sing it. So and people have lost their memory and all those things, particularly those who've got Alzheimer's. And they can remember these old songs and everything. So tell us a little bit how you've started that and how that's affecting the people you're dealing with and showing mercy to them and the gift that God's given you. Yeah, um, music therapy. We could have a whole talk on <laughs> music therapy itself. Um, but, you know, I always, I always think that us Catholics, I think we kind of get music therapy. Um, and that's because of how much we we love and appreciate music in the mass and we understand how it can affect us as people. Um, and yeah, I often have conversations with people of faith about music therapy and I, you know, I start to share about some of the background to it and they go, yeah, that makes so much sense. You know, music, it lifts the spirit and it touches the soul and all these sentiments. It's like, yeah, we get this. <laughs> um, but music therapy, just to give a bit more of a um, clinical background to it, it is a, an evidence-based allied health profession and um, music therapists basically use music as the therapeutic tool to promote health and well-being um, for people in all different kinds of um, you know, diagnoses, illnesses, um, disabilities, conditions. Uh, music therapists work in hospitals, they work in aged care and palliative care, um, uh, special schools, early childhood intervention for children with disabilities, mental health, um, prisons, uh, there's lots of different spaces in which music therapists work um, and I've certainly had the honour of working in some of these spaces at my clinical placements so far. Um, some of the most profound for me have been learning about music's um, engagement with the brain and how when people experience brain injury or stroke, um, these sorts of things, music's uh, ability to actually stimulate the brain is so strong um, that it can actually help people to retrain parts of their, their brain. So, for instance, I worked with some stroke patients at my previous placement in the hospital and we used things like therapeutic singing, um, where I would play a familiar song, I'm talking like literally Bon Jovi or something, and um, leave out some target words for the patient to actually vocalise when they've lost the ability to speak, and they will vocalise. So that's not because um, uh, that's not because they're choosing not to speak otherwise, but it's that they there's you know there's a connection that's going wrong from the brain to the actual vocal apparatus. But music actually stimulates an automatic speech response. So all of a sudden they're using their voice again. And of course you can imagine how their faces would light up and what it does for their, you know, their, their mental health when they actually hear themselves speaking again. Um, that's just one example. And I've uh, now, now in the more palliative care space, um, I'm working with people in the final weeks and months of their lives. And, music therapy in this space is much more about promoting quality of life. Um, I'm working with some lovely, lovely people doing music legacies, which is where you sit down with someone who has an affinity for music and you say, well, do you think we can sort of timestamp your life span, your entire life using musical memories? You know, like what's your earliest memory of music? And you know they might say, oh well, my mum used to sing me this um, this lullaby she told me about. So we start there, and we go through the whole lifespan, and that's an opportunity for this person to engage in meaning making and to reminisce. Music prompts reminiscence in such a beautiful way, um, and it's a it can really uplift the person during a time which can be very much um, marked with pain and suffering um, and loneliness often as well. Um, so yeah, that's been really beautiful. And I think overall, 
um, you know, a lot of people know that music is good for us. Like music can, can make you happy, it can lift your mood. If you're feeling sad, you can listen to a sad song and the music can really validate your feeling in that moment and you can sit with that. Um, and yeah, there's, there's so much scope for music therapy in Australia and it's certainly a growing profession, so I'm excited about that. And um, yeah, I certainly hope that it'll be part of my journey in the future as well. Now with the future, of course, you have come into the Cadman family. Tell a little bit about how you met Joseph, was it? Yeah, sure. Um, Joseph and I met, it'd be how many years now? About five or six years um, at, a, at a youth event. St. Peter and Paul's in North Melbourne, I think it was. Um, the Capuchins used to run some youth events and that's where we first met. And then we chatted a little bit on Facebook Messenger. And then apparently I left him on red and as we say, I ghosted him. <laughs> for four years. <laughs> and then we re-met at a, at a young adults event. That was um, the confraternity of St. Michael that was running uh, monthly or something like that in the city. And um, we were all sitting down for a dinner and then there was a spare seat next to me and Joseph just happened to sit in it and I hadn't seen him in about four years. And of course, at, at that point he had really long hair, but I remembered him as having short hair, sort of like right now. And um, it was kind of like a double take moment. Whoa, <laughs> Joseph Cadman. <laughs> and then, yeah, the rest is history. We, we started dating and um, we discerned marriage together. We dated for um, about a year and then, and then Joseph proposed to me and we were married at the start of this year. And um, yeah, it's been an absolutely amazing journey. He's such an incredible person. Anyone who's close to him knows how amazing he is and how loving he is and how he'll do anything for anyone. And Just like his father, yes? Absolutely, John. What do you think? <laughs> like father, like son. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah so that. I'm so blessed with Joseph and the entire family. Great. You went on World Youth Day back in Poland. Tell us a little bit of your experience there. In fact, 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 both of you were at World Youth Day, but you didn't know you were both yeah. there. Yeah, we were both there, but we didn't, we didn't meet there. <laughs> that was 2016. I was... Um, in Krakow, was it? Krakow? Yeah, Krakow, Poland, yeah. And I was, I was on the school pilgrimage, which was interesting because a lot of my peers on the pilgrimage weren't actually practicing their faith. So that presented a challenge in a way. Um, but there were kind of like a handful of us on the school pilgrimage who were actually practicing our faith. And we actually have sort of still, we still remain connected now, eight years later or whatever it is. Um, yeah, that was amazing. That was um, the, the real big takeaway for me was the kind of like very obvious experience of the universal church when you're in a country yourself across, you know, all the way across the ocean. Um, and then when you're there, there's people from all over the world. And then, you know, all of a sudden you're, you're in mass together or you're praying together or you're singing hymns together. Um, it was such an incredible experience and it certainly helped me to feel, um, yeah, I guess much more pr proud of my faith and like it was something very huge and, and powerful to be a part of. Um, I think we sometimes forget that, you know, the Catholic Church is so big and so alive all over the world and that every Sunday when we go to Mass, all over the world everyone's at the same Mass, the same readings and the same sacraments. It's just such an incredible thing that we have in, in our universal church. So I think that was the main takeaway that's stuck with me all these years um, and I certainly would recommend World Youth Day if anyone gets the opportunity to go with with a good group and a good chaplain and um, to really open yourself up to whatever God has in store for you on the journey and to make sure you do your prayers at night and your journaling like really make it a pilgrimage do the big walk do the sleep out under the stars and hurt your back and then pray for healing do it all it's really great well, we do like to dream, but that might be out of my league. Okay, um, Catholic artists in the music industry, what do you think you've got to offer? Mm. Yeah, I think um, ultimately what we have to offer in any industry, but in the music industry, is the truth. Um, you know, we have the truth in our faith and in a world which is so incredibly into relativism and you do you and I'll do me and 
you be who you want to be and I'll do what I want and da da da. It's absolutely exhausting, especially for um, for all of us, but I think especially for young people these days who are in in this generation that's very, very confused and, you know, addicted to our devices and going through, um, you know, this incredible time where the mental health crisis is skyrocketing in our generation. Um, our faith has the truth. Our faith has the key to happiness and joy, um, you know, ultimately in heaven, but, but also here on earth. And I think that it's really important that we... That's why it's really important that we do kind of wear our faith on our sleeve a little bit. And in whatever way that is, it doesn't have to be overtly preaching at the jazz gig. But, you know, it's just, you know, maybe wearing your crucifix outside of your top or um, just, you know, letting people know if they ask you, like, yeah, do you go to church on a Sunday? Like, what? You go to church? Who does that? You know, like, have those conversations and just, you know, be, be open about it. Um, because you don't know, like you said before, John, you don't know what seeds you're going to plant for someone and ultimately we're meant to make disciples of all nations and we need to do that wherever we can in whatever way we feel we can um, because that's all we have to offer people. There's one person in your life that had an enormous influence in your Catholic faith, who would that be? Wow, that's a really big question. Um, I'll probably say my dad. Um, just thinking of like my whole life, um, he, you know, he's been through a lot. He lived through the war in Lebanon, and um, you know, he'll tell us stories of times when he he should have died. You know, when there were bombs and guns and everything else. Um, and then, of course, like his journey to Australia. He lost his father when he was only twelve, and he was the oldest of four kids, and that was in the middle of the war. So immense hardship but I think because of that and his unwavering faith through throughout his life he um, he really was so strong in promoting the faith to our whole family um, and I think yeah like I I just feel so blessed that I you know I'd come home from school at, in the afternoon and dad would come, come home from work and I had a father who would literally prostrate in front of my eyes in, in front of a crucifix you know he used to do that um, when we were children and that's really powerful as a child to watch your father who's you know the the strong person in the house it's you know the hero of the household like humble himself before the Lord in prayer that's incredibly incredibly powerful for a child to witness um, and yeah, I feel very, I feel just so grateful that God sent me Joseph, who I know will do the same for our children, and um, will um, do everything in his power to represent God's love in, in the home and to share faith with our little ones, God willing. <laughs> That's great. Well, you, you you speak very beautifully, you, you sing superbly, and you're certainly a very humble young lady. And I said to Joseph, you've been very blessed with a wonderful wife and uh, as I say happy wife happy life and I'm certainly I'll be happy together for many many years uh, a dream for you was to put out an album to put out a CD and you, during the COVID period with many of us were locked down you were working writing songs and you wrote this uh, beautiful CD called Still uh, and it's got uh, 10, or, 10 or so tracks on there and so tell us a little bit about the CD and, and where you do shows so if people want to come along and see a, a proper jazz concert yeah, sure. come on. yeah, so um, we have like a bit of a joke which in, in the jazz scene, which is probably terrible um, in, the, in the minds of many Catholics, but when we create a CD, before we have kids of our own, we say, this is my baby. Because <laughs> 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 you pour, you know, months and hours and just immense uh, tears <laughs> over your, your, the creation of an album. A lot goes into it. Um, but yeah, that, that album has 10 original songs on it. And I kind of wrote them over the past three or so years. And when I finally had 10 of them, and we were just playing them on gigs, me and my band, it was my then guitarist, Harry Tinney, absolutely wonderful musician. He, um, he said to me, Liv, you've got 10 songs now. Why don't we record this? We should make a CD. And I was like, oh, yeah, maybe we should. Of course, he didn't tell me how much it was going to cost. But <laughs> thanks you be to God. You didn't tell me either. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> thanks be to God, I, I was able to make it happen. And we went into the studio for one day. 
and recorded in one day, which was a mammoth effort, but because of the kind of music it is, most of it was all happened live in the moment with um, my quintet, there was five of us. And yeah, the, the songs on there, some of them are very much in that traditional swing kind of style. Um, you know, there's some love songs on there. There's some kind of lighthearted, satirical. One of, one of the songs is called Isolation Song. It's track number one, and it's literally about the COVID lockdown. So that's just kind of a bit of fun. And then um, we have some of the more kind of spiritual songs that have uh, certainly themes of my faith in them as well. Um, yeah, so it was, it was a great journey getting it out into the world and big relief on release day. That was last November now, coming up to a year. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a nice thing to sort of just share, be able to share my original music with the world and whoever listens to it, I don't know, but so hopefully knowing, they like it. <laughs> so not knowing about the jazz venues, um, I've been to a few of them over the years, a jazz club and there's one in Brunswick. So uh, it's like going back into the 1930s and 40s, the way they've set it up. It's beautifully dimly lit, but uh, just tell us a little bit about those clubs and how long they've been around for. You perform at those? Yeah, so I play um, in jazz clubs in Melbourne. There's a few lovely venues. The main one is probably Paris Cat Jazz Club, which is in the CBD. Um, I'll be there in December actually playing the album with my band. Um, so that's a, that's a beautiful venue. There's, there's probably a handful of really good ones. And if you want to sort of follow show dates and that sort of thing, um, it's probably best to find the dates on social media. So it's just my name, Olivia Shamoon Canavan on Facebook and Instagram. I also have an emailing list. So if you would like me to add you to my emailing list, just let me know afterwards and I'll, I'll do that. Um, yeah, but lovely little venues and nice places to kind of have a night out, have a drink and a snack and have some jazz, some chit chat. Right. Yeah. Well, Olivia, we started off with two beautiful songs. So hopefully you'll be able to finish with a couple of songs or maybe one from your CD, another one that people may know. But uh, if anyone's know, interested in buying the CD, $20, seniors discounts, 15 Priest, you can have them for nothing because you've worked hard. So a uh, big hand for Libby, she's done a wonderful job. Thank you. And to my lovely father-in-law, John. And, uh, big hand for Johnny behind me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. all the people putting it together. So show us your talent again. Let us hear that beautiful voice and uh, explain a little bit about the first song you're going to do and then We'll go from there. Thank you. So I'm going to play a song from my album now. Um, this song is called Lead On. And when I wrote it, um, I was really writing about, you know, uh, the search for guidance and how as people of faith, we have the love of God, which nourishes us and leads us through life. And, you know, we have an incredible peace giving thing, which is that we can um, surrender ourselves to the Lord and and rely on him and his His guidance and his providence to help us through, through our lives, through decision making and all these things. And um, so this song really was about um, God's love in, in one way. But then also as I was writing it, I, I sort of thought, as this happens sometimes when we write, we write these sorts of songs, it also kind of sounds like a love song. <laughs> um, and I thought, like, this, this also applies to my husband, Joseph. And so I kind of was sitting there with like, well, who is it about? Is it about God's love or is it about Joseph's love? <laughs> and I think that's probably a compliment to him that, um, that it was kind of like hard to, to decide between the two. <laughs> so... That's really, that's really what it is for me, but for you, it may be something different, and I hope you like it. It's called Lead On. Someone else's back 
then I see you. You're the only one I follow. Your love is real. You cover me. finish with um, a hymn and I hoped that you might sing with me this time and I, I certainly hope I'm not going to be blocking the screen here so you'll just have to let me know if you can see it uh, we're going to do Godhead here in hiding which was written by great saint and doctor of the church St Thomas Aquinas and this is probably my favorite hymn actually um, exploring the mystery of the Eucharist and the second verse especially, speaking of what we were discussing before about truth, there's a line in it which I'm not sure why, but I think it's it's probably God working. Every time we sing this song in choir, I literally get chills in my body when um, we sing the line, what God's son has told me, take for truth I do. Truth himself speaks truly or there's nothing true. 
so incredibly profound and beautiful. So we probably won't do seven verses, or we might yeah. make this evening even later than it already is, but beautiful, the numbers are there, so I'll call them out. So please sing along with me. Let's have a congregational hymn moment, even though we're not actually a congregation. But yeah. Olivia. Thanks, John, for uh, a really beautiful and inspiring uh, interview. Uh, I, I was really touched by it. There were many, um, many beautiful things that jumped out at me that you said. You're a very articulate person, Olivia. You explain uh, you know, a lot of things very well, uh, especially the plight, I think, of young people today, the, the challenges faced by young Catholics in, um, in, in some challenging environments at university and other, other spheres. To something you jumped out at me really, really spoke to me. Um, you mentioned that you know perhaps you don't you don't feel like you're very comfortable in those situations where there's an argument about about uh, you know apologetics or, or things like that. Um, that's maybe not not something you feel comfortable doing. Um, I think that's a good thing because uh, like I, I I feel like I do know a lot of those arguments really well. I've studied a lot of a lot of apologetics. Doesn't really do anything. Doesn't really convince anyone. Doesn't doesn't seem to change a lot of hearts in my experience. Anyway, maybe that's just the obnoxious way I put it across. <laughs> but um, the beauty that you that you give to people through your music, through your singing, um, through your through the songs that you've written, I think that's going to have a far far more powerful impact. Uh, there's an old saying: that "Beauty will beauty will save the world," and you're bringing a lot of beauty into the world. Thank you. Um, 
If you'd like to help us to thank Olivia for her, um, for the gift she's given us tonight, the, the blessing that she's given us tonight with her music and her, her um, interview, there's uh, a donation, some donation buckets coming around, and uh, it'd be really great if you could be generous and uh, help us to say thanks to Olivia by making a donation tonight. Um, and don't forget, the CDs are, are there at the back. I'm, I'm getting quick because I think they're going to be all gone um, pretty shortly. I know I'll be buying a couple. Uh, I'll also send out a link. There's an online version of, of Olivia's CD, so perhaps for some people that's more um, useful. So that it was, it was in the link to the God Blue email that was sent out um, about tonight's event, and I'll make sure I include it in the next email as well. I uh, just wanted to let you know about some future events coming up. So next month we've got... Um, three events that are kind of connected to the to the God and Beer, God and Beer um, sphere. Um, the first one's on the 3rd of October. So an opportunity came up. Archbishop Julian Porteous um, has written a book and he wanted to come to Melbourne and give some talks and through a friend of mine um, I'm helping to organise that. It's going to be out in the western suburbs and we thought this was a good opportunity because in the western suburbs of Knights of the Southern Cross have been wanting to have some God and Beer events out there. And so this is the first one of those. It's on the Tuesday, the 3rd of October. Archbishop Julian Porteous will be speaking about his, um, his new book, Becoming Missionary Disciples. Um, for those of you who don't know, Archbishop Porteous, he's, he's one of the best bishops in Australia. Um, really courageous, outspoken, faithful bishop. Um, you know, re really tremendous. And by focusing on this topic, I think he's really, you know, doing something important because a lot of the times we get distracted by other things in the church, by politics or, or arguing about this or that, but really becoming missionary disciples, that's our, that's our main reason, uh, that's our main purpose in the Catholic Church, that's, that's the great commission that Jesus gave us to go out and make disciples of all nations. So that's on the Tuesday the 3rd of October. The next night, Archbishop Portis is giving a second talk in a different location. That's at Australian Catholic University in, in the city, in, just near the cathedral. So there's the details of that one there. So I know they're similar topics, but hopefully they're in different enough parts of Melbourne. Um, and then the third event is the regular God and Beer, which will be back here at the night, the second Monday of the month. It's you know, our usual um, schedule. And this one's something really close to my heart. I'm a school teacher in a, in a Catholic school, have been for many years, and you know, a, lot of, a lot of people feel there's maybe something, a few things gone slightly awry with Catholic education, that maybe the faith isn't being passed on as it should be in Catholic schools. And so Professor John Haldane, one of the preeminent um, philosophers of any, of any stripe in the world, who also happens to be a Catholic, he's going to speak on this topic. He's just um, written a report for the Archdiocese of Melbourne where he, he's examined in depth this question of you know, what can we do to improve the, the, the way in which Catholic schools are achieving their mission of passing on the Catholic faith. And so he's going to have some really interesting insights into that. Um, I can't wait to hear what he, what he has to say. So that is the, uh, the three God and Beer events coming up. Um, just to finish off, I'd like to thank um, Catholic Development Fund for supporting God and Beer. They're a great great supporters of us, and what am I forgetting? Right, Andrew's got up on the screen another great upcoming event. It's a men's weekend run by Men Alive, coming up on the 28th and 29th of October. So if you uh, would be interested in that, please check out, I can't see the link there, but um, I'll, I'll make sure I put the link in the um, next God and Beer email. So, menalive.org.au. Thanks, Andrew. That'll be a great event. Oh, yeah. And uh, one final event is the Benedict Conference, which is coming up. Um, I hope they've got some tickets left. Last I heard it was sold out, but I also heard that they're trying to open it up and, and uh, make more seats available because it became so popular. So, going to be some great speakers there. Bishop Robert Barron, um, Tracy Rowland, who you may recall from here at God and Beer earlier in the year, Jason Everett, it's a really amazing speaker. Some of them, I think, appearing by um, sort of video conference, but they'll be speaking to the, the Benedict Conference event. So please do check out um, benedictconference.com. It's going to be awesome, an awesome event. Yeah.
Amen. Thanks everyone. I hope you uh, enjoyed tonight. And um, don't forget to grab a, grab a CD. Oh, sorry, if you haven't signed up to the email list, if you don't get to go to your emails, just sign up at the list at the table up there. Oh yeah, please um, check out social media links, Facebook, YouTube and, and Twitter. Um, make sure you're following God and Beer on those. And uh, I should mention as well those events that I mentioned earlier, the, the three God and Beer events. There's posters up on the, on the table at the entrance. If you'd like to grab one for your parish or to share with other people, just grab one of those posters. That's what they're there for. Take one away. Thank you.